The Sahara has been a pipeline for smuggling and trafficking for well over a thousand years. With ties to Europe that date back to antiquity, Libya has long been an area for these illicit flows. Since the fall of Gaddafi in 2011, the smuggling and trafficking business of armed groups has increased dramatically in Libya. Instability and state breakdown has allowed traditional tribal trans-Saharan trade in drugs, counterfeit products, migrants and arms to grow to roughly 80 million US dollars. In response, international organizations concerned with countering illegal migration have poured money into Libya and its neighboring states. The receipts of this investment have been armed groups. With state affiliations at their side, they have armed, mobilized and co-opted themselves into Libya's security apparatus without becoming subservient to it. What has emerged from the struggle to maintain state and border security is a push and pull between security forces for Libyans and migration issues for international bodies. You're listening to Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This week, we're in Libya. We will dive into the challenges of conducting security sector reform in an environment where organized crime is embedded into formal and informal power structures. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. The presence of Libya's illicit economy grew exponentially after the 2011 revolution. In its aftermath, a lack of control over informal systems paved the way for new forms of illegal revenue generation for armed groups. Over the years, these groups have developed a knack for providing services to the state. But behind these services, the groups conceal their hidden operations within the illicit economy. Each one has a specialty. Some of them are very good with genuine counterterrorism. Others help in crucial ways. They help the ability of the state to go out and arrest someone, for example, a technocrat that has been stealing money or refusing to leave his post by being demoted. Shalel Hashoui is a research fellow at the Klingendal Institute in the Netherlands. You have other armed groups that are obviously running migrant detention centers. Informal armed groups, those actors are expected to intercept migrants in the sea and bring them back. And of course, you cannot bring them back for them to try the next day from the same beach. You have to lock them up. And that service is considered a crucial thing for the Libyan state to do. And you can go down the list and you have others in the east, for example, that are known for patrolling Benghazi. Jalel, you've indicated that armed groups wield power for their own agenda, but who do they answer to? If you start removing all those informal armed groups, what you'll be left with is a network of politicians, warlords, tribal leaders, municipal figures that uh, are not necessarily physically powerful. They actually cultivated a a very sophisticated network based on alliances and promises and quid pro quo arrangements. And that has matured over the years. And that too is difficult to undo. But part of it is a series of positions that exist on paper as being part of the formal state. So you have those organic links between a function that is part of the official org chart and an armed groups that are hybrid in nature, And how is it in the interest of these armed groups to perform these state security roles? Well, first of all, they receive the benefits of what I would call the aura of officialdom. Recognition. Recognition is an important currency. Salaries for every militiaman. That means more social acceptance, a form of respect. And of course, the option to pursue illicit activities to make ends meet. And those extracurricular activities, they're derived usually through the control of an airport, the control of some form of facility, access to financial institution that you're supposedly protecting. And those legal benefits, they don't go to every member of the armed group. They go usually to the mid-level leader or more often to the top leader. So, you know, on the ground, what you see very often is relatively honest armed men They're not necessarily behaving like gangsters, every one of them. 
the gangsterism aspect of it usually begins with mid-level or top leaders. When it comes to these extracurricular activities and the gangsterism of some of these groups, what activities are they focused on in the illicit economy? I think that the scheme that I would like to emphasize here is the ability to use the threat of force as a way to blackmail civilian institutions into signing some contracts with very specific companies. Those militias are connected to business people that actually work for them. And they have created a lot of legal entities as fronts to perform sometimes genuine service and sometimes completely bogus service. Let me take an example. Let's say a hospital is required because of COVID in 2020 to perform additional steps in terms of sterilizing the facility or distributing free masks or putting some checkpoints ahead of the hospital in question. The hospital is not going to be able to decide the price and is not going to be able to decide which company they're going to outsource this required service to. And the decision is really made by the local warlord. The hospital in question is probably going to overpay for a service that sometimes will exist and sometimes doesn't even exist. So this is one of the most significant examples that I could give here. Jalal, you talked about an aura of officialdom that gives these armed groups a sort of social acceptance. Does this mean that citizens have a positive view of their role and function in society? It varies across space. It varies across time. It varies depending on the armed group. Some armed groups are perceived as more legitimate than the next one. In a context where a warlord by the name of Khalifa Haftar, backed by a whole slew of very prestigious countries, attacks the city, you're going to be more tolerant. You're not going to necessarily go out to protest in the street. You're not going to necessarily hate the militia. Now, if peace comes back like it has since June, and if in the meantime, COVID grows, and if on top of it, the electric grid or the electric device of Libya continues falling apart, and the banknote shortage becomes even more acute, then, of course, your sentiment vis-a-vis the armed groups that you deal with, your hatred for them is going to increase even more. The security sector has a number of players that aren't Libyan authorities themselves, but international actors. Can you explain what security role the EU and other factions of the international community might be playing in Libya? No serious security sector reform can be attempted within the foreseeable future. Uh, Now that the offensive Tripoli was crushed, I think the UN has a unique role to play. You cannot just trust the Libyans and only Libyans with SSR. So you need some form of framework that has to be provided by non-Libyan. And that cannot be just a state because Turkey or the UAE is going to be biased as well. So you need some form of neutrality. The only game in town in terms of neutrality is the UN. Now, the EU is something else. The EU has been obsessed with the notion of reducing the number of migrant arrivals into Sicily. As a result, I consider the EU as having an amount of credibility that is much lower than the UN. Libyans criticize it on a daily basis. I wouldn't say that they see it as particularly cynical or evil. But now the image of the EU, because of clear single priority of whatever happens on the EU territory, as far as migrant arrivals, that is so clear now that I think that the EU will have to do a lot of work before it gets taken seriously on any other topic. What has been the result of this focus on irregular migration in terms of efforts to develop a functional security sector? 2017 was a very peculiar year because of whatever Italy decided to do in the space of six to 12 months. It really intervened. Uh, You know, it was worried by the fact that you had 12,000, 15,000 irregular migrants arriving in Sicily every month. The interior ministry of Marco Minetti at the time decided to change that. And they went and did a series of things through the internationally recognized government of Tripoli. I'm referring to the salaries that they extended to some other players. They sent equipment, they sent boats, they actually trained some of the militias. I keep hearing about potentially direct financial transactions with some of the key armed groups that were responsible before July 2017 for actually facilitating the flow of migrants into Sicily. So whatever Italy did actually kind of worked out. They managed to do exactly what they had set out to do, which is to alter the behavior of those armed groups. And that went with a side effect, which was to actually incorporate, to force 
or at least inspired the GNA into integrating those armed groups by giving them even more recognition, regular salaries, protection in terms of status. The summer of 2017, but that has had major consequences on whatever happened on Libyan land now, because migrants didn't stop showing up from sub-Sahara Africa. Maybe they are not arriving at the same rate, but they still arrive. And you have to do something with them. And of course, you end up with some of the actors that are abusing them. Because if you abuse them, you're more likely to extract cash. Now that Libya has been in a period of peace since June, is it time to start having a proper conversation about minimizing the influence of armed groups for the sake of security sector reform in Libya? Well, first of all, there's a difference between minimizing their influence versus trying to dismantle them and make them disappear from the face of the earth. A majority of their physical presence can stay and should stay. What needs to be altered is the amount of cohesion that exists. This is not about centralizing necessarily, just making sure that your security landscape is not filled with conflicts or overlap. You try to shape it into making a little bit more sense in terms of constituting a cogent, coherent mass of armed groups that are more likely to work together and obey the state. And again, it doesn't have to be a centralized scheme. It could be pluralistic. It could be devolved into local authorities, as long as those nodes, if you will, are part of a clear, impersonal, anonymous, neutral expression of the ultimate state. Jalel Hashoui is a research fellow at the Klingendal Institute in the Netherlands. Libya is regarded as a strategic location from a foreign policy perspective. It is a through point for different regions of Africa and a gateway to Europe through the Sahel. Southern Libya also operates as an informal safe haven for terrorists. This powerful dynamic has been exploited by organized criminal networks. But as they've expanded their networks, they've become more entrenched in local communities. What's emerged from this is a push and pull between ensuring state security and the need to pacify community actors. In Libya, you've kind of seen a hybridization of security governance in that a lot of these groups are, to an extent, socially embedded or have quite a dense network with locals in territory under their control. So they are somewhat wary of antagonizing local population. Emad Badi is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. They've ensured that kind of their revenue generation mechanisms are sometimes accompanied by, let's say, improved security provisions in their respective locale. But they possess, however, links with local communities, but also they have relationships of convenience or direct connivance sometimes of group leaders and government-affiliated figures and politicians. So there's a detachment between these distinct kind of armed groups and their local communities to a degree, but they do um, depend on the communal links or the geographical factors or where they are present in order to operationalize their revenue generation mechanisms. Ahmad, before we dive in, can you tell us where exactly armed groups fit in terms of organized crime in Libya? So they really deal with anything, depending on what opportunities exist. I would say that some have definitely looked into diversifying their sources of revenue from 2011 onwards, depending on kind of the opportunities or the networks that they had but also on the, let's say, the cost of the diversification itself. So for instance, you'd find that groups that started off doing fuel smuggling have slowly then went into migrant trafficking and sometimes vice versa, depending on really the the opportunity cost of doing that, both from a scrutiny from the state, but also sometimes from transnational bodies that look at counter-terrorism or counter-trafficking. Now let's flesh out the current security setup in Libya. Can you paint the picture for us of who controls what from a security perspective? It's very difficult because it's hybrid, but the word hybrid doesn't necessarily capture the complexities and disparities of control. So for instance, let's say in a very urbanized setting like the capital Tripoli or the informal, let's say, capital of eastern Libya, Benghazi, you would have armed groups that control particular fiefdoms in a way. They have clear geographic delimitations sometimes to the uh, the neighborhood levels of what they control in those areas. And they operate sometimes in cooperation or 
sometimes contend directly with the state apparatus for security. In other cases, they have also infiltrated those bodies. And post-2011, they provided a lot of the staff that were embedded in those state structures, so to speak. So a security provision is both hybrid in that it's informal stakeholders cooperating with state stakeholders, but the state stakeholders themselves are sometimes both formal and informal. So it's quite a complicated setting, let's say. If you look at, for example, the interior ministry that is supposed to ensure security provision or human security at the local level, it operates formally through security directorates, which are supposed to coordinate kind of the deployment of policing units. There's a body called the Criminal Investigations Department that is also supposed to be deployed whenever there's a crime that is recorded or anything of the sort. However, even those bodies, both the security directorates and the criminal investigations departments, are heavily infiltrated by armed groups and sometimes are directly challenged by a local armed group. So it's quite a complex setting and it differs from almost neighborhood to neighborhood in urban settings and town to town in other settings. Where does that leave citizens? Do they broadly accept the security role that's being played by armed groups who also engage in criminal activity? So there's a balancing act, so to speak, between armed groups and local communities. It really, again, differs from armed group to armed group. Some are closer to local communities. Some are heavily socially embedded. Others are completely socially insulated. And that is a factor that influences whether they will predate, let's say, over civilian populations, but also how much coercion they'll use against them. And then conversely, it also affects whether local communities can actually have some form of what we call informal oversight over the armed groups. Because for instance, let's say a crime occurred in one particular area, you could have informal oversight bodies such as social councils or elders councils, or even influential local stakeholders really that call armed groups to account. Now it's a very informal contingent approach, but it does highlight that there is an ability for local communities to navigate this mosaic of armed groups operating in different locales of Libya. I will say also that from a legal perspective or from a state perspective, it's very difficult for citizens to actually have oversight or keep the armed groups accountable through state channels, because those avenues have kind of been rendered irrelevant by the fact that armed groups have heavily infiltrated the state. So one of the kind of areas through which armed groups are not kept accountable is this informal approach. Are these armed groups able to meet the security needs of local communities? It really boils down in Libya to the basic levels of human security at this stage, because that is the threshold that hasn't been met in most locales. Whenever an armed group is able to consolidate territory and establish some form of security, even if sometimes that's done through very coercive means, at times the community accepts that level of coercion in exchange for the security provided. However, even those sometimes arrangements are short-lived because communities sometimes expect something in return, particularly since the armed groups that sometimes establish territorial control over that particular area come from the community itself. So there's a relationship of kind of dependence between them and higher authorities. So it's not as simple as the armed groups and the communities are completely separate entities, sometimes the relationship is a little more horizontal, so to speak. And that's what complicates things in terms of security sector reform. Considering this is also something of a proxy war for countries like Russia and Turkey in their involvement in Libya, how has that impacted security in the country? I wouldn't say that it has impacted security positively. I mean, most of these actors are not really invested in the human security of citizens, so to speak, as much as they're invested in securing the loyalty or increasing the dependence of local factions on their support in order to achieve their geopolitical aspirations, whether they be inside Libya or even related to other theaters at times in the case of Turkey and Russia in particular. But I will say that some of these actors, to an extent, have engaged in capacity improvement of local factions, which they nominally back. However, I would say that that approach is by design weaponizes sort of security sector reform in a way which makes it feed conflict instead of actually improving human security. So it isn't exactly conducive to anything positive, unfortunately. If the objective then is human security, 
Do you think there needs to be an extensive focus on organized crime as an objective of security reform? Security sector reform is defined as the technical process where security provision and management and oversight would be kept more effective and more accountable. So organized crime is part of that. However, the problem is sometimes it's assumed that organized crime kind of operates outside of the state. So even if at times the traditional approach to security sector reform is to build capacity of institutions. However, in Libya, where it's a very hybrid setting, the institutions themselves are sometimes sources of friction or are dysfunctional to the extent that they are not capable or they're not built to really provide human security. I mean, for instance, my perspective right now is that the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense, there is absolutely no difference between them to Libyan actors. They're merely different budget lines. So approaching those institutions in a way where you're relying on them to kind of improve security at the local level could definitely backfire. So you need to delve to the more local level at first to be able to address crime. Unless you do that, you may become actually a driver of crime. You may catalyze the symptoms at the local level. And finally, Ahmad, when we look at security sector reform in Libya, what role then do these armed groups play? Any effort towards SSR, security sector reforms, that doesn't embrace the fact that the context is hybridized to an extent will be bound to fail because the social embeddedness and the hybrid nature of the security landscape, it implies that the functionality of the security sector and security sector governance and even the quality of human security at the local level is predicated on the type of relationship that exists between formal forces and institutions on the one hand and quasi-informal ones, such as local armed actors, but also communities. So if you're not embracing that reality, at least in the short term, you're not going to be able to improve human security. So my perspective in terms of actually improving human security should be that there should be a dual track, so to speak, one that focuses on institutional building in order to fold these groups under the state, and then a more local track that focuses on enhancing human security through security directorates, through the more kind of local structures that exist, some of which are informal. Emad Badi is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. In Libya, A delicate balance exists between security sector reform and addressing local needs. International actors' influence on the security sector centers around countering irregular migration. To bolster these efforts, they've poured resources into organized criminal networks that have diversified their offerings in post-2011 Libya. The net effect has been a weaponization of the security sector, that has become a catalyst for crime at the local level. For criminal networks, their elevated status comes with a cost. In order to continue receiving fringe benefits as purveyors of state security, they must satisfy the needs of the local communities in which they operate. That concludes this episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy. I'd like to give a special thanks to our guests, Jalel Hashawi and Ahmad Badi. Want to learn more? Log on to www.globalinitiative.net and read some of our other publications. You can also listen to last week's podcast, Police Assassinations in South Africa and Cheetah Smuggling in Somaliland, as well as other podcasts from the GI. Please take the time to leave a review, subscribe and share the podcast on social media. It helps us get noticed and improve the show. When you hear from us again, we'll be covering illegal gold mining and Afghan meth in Southern Africa. Until then, this podcast was produced by Alexandria Sahai Williams. I'm Lindim Tongana. Thanks for listening.